This week, the long-awaited independent review into the government's counter-terrorism program, PREVENT, has been published. It's been close to four years in the process, and the review has been marred by controversy and critique, primarily from the Muslim community, who feel they've been unfairly targeted and ostracized by the program. PREVENT has been championed by successive UK governments as the first line of defense to combat radicalization, but its critics say it has instead criminalized ordinary citizens, and many of its victims have been children. The review, overseen by William Showcross, has published a list of recommendations which all have been accepted by the government, who promises to ramp up its focus on the key threat of Islamist terrorism. Dr. Leila Ayat al Hajj is the director and senior caseworker at Prevent Watch, a community led initiative which has supported individuals affected by the Prevent program in nearly 600 cases. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Welcome to The Big Picture. Thank you for having me on. We are scrambling to read this report that had just come out an hour before uh, me and you sat down to talk right now. I have here a list of recommendations and conclusions. You've been looking through them yourself as well. But I want to begin this conversation by asking you what the PREVENT program is. This program that has been uh, that's received so many complaints from the Muslim community over the years, but essentially is the primary focus of counterterrorism for this government. What is the PREVENT program? So the PREVENT duty is uh, one arm of the UK's counterterrorism strategy. So the counterterrorism strategy has several other arms and those are slightly more tangible with regards to how to prepare um, and protect uh, society from a potential terror attack. There's Pursue, which includes um, intelligence services for those who are like plotting or associated, so these people would be followed. <clears throat> and then there's pre uh, Prevent, which is completely within the pre-crime space, and there is no intention to even commit an attack by the person. There's no planning, no preparation or anything. So you're talking about a space where it's almost like crystal ball gazing, where you're saying, well, actually, based on this idea or this um, part of speech that you say at age 10, you know, in 10 years time, when you're 20, you are going to go on to be a potential terrorist. And that's kind of the logic behind prevent. And of course, there is no evidence behind that. We can't do that for any other crime. So I'm not sure why it is that it's been so readily accepted that we can do this um, for terrorism. And it impacts thousands of people every year who are reported to prevent, the majority of which are children. And it has been uh, a statutory duty for public sector workers, so your doctors and teachers, since 2015. And um, yeah, so in 2019, after over a decade of concerns about prevent, about it particularly targeting the Muslim community and being discriminatory, um, about it curtailing freedom of speech and other human rights, uh, there was finally like a concedement by government to review the prevent duty and that's where we have ended up today four years later we ended up with a report by William Shawcross. So as the name suggests prevent is a program that is attempting to try and highlight and isolate cases of potential radicalization in the community and put a stop to them before they even get that far. Has it succeeded in doing this? So what it says on the tin in terms of prevent is that it's supposed to stop people from being drawn into terrorism. And then there are these terms like radicalization and extremism that are very um, highly conflated. There's not really any real definition. They don't really understand how people go on and why people go on to commit acts of terrorism. But there is this conveyor belt theory that people become radicalized and have extreme thoughts or behaviors, and then they go on to to do acts of terrorism, which in and of itself has been rebutted. And the government has suggested that they no longer use this idea of this conveyor belt theory um, from a person like being radicalized to going on to terrorism, but in practice they still do. So yes, people are referred if they are showing signs of like vulnerability to radicalization. And of course these people themselves aren't really sure what radicalization and extremism is. They're not experts, so they're based, basing it on a lot of their biases and their own prejudice. They're basing it on what is said in the media, which as you can imagine is not helpful. Um, and they are making referrals and those referrals go initially and are vetted by a counterterrorism officer. And then that counterterrorism officer uses their own bias and prejudice logic to determine whether or not somebody might be 
might go on to be a, terrorism, a terrorist in the future. And the problem with this is that from the moment that this referral is made, there is harm to that person. And as I said, the majority of these people are children. So that counterterrorism officer, in order for them to establish whether or not they think uh, this person might go on uh, to be a terrorist in the future, i.e., are they vulnerable to radicalization? So they're not even saying, is this person you know, plotting or planning a terror attack? They're saying, are they vulnerable to being radicalized? They're not even radicalized yet. Are you vulnerable to being radicalized, which may, may then go on to, to end up being a terror act? Um, the problem is, is that in order to understand that, they, they usually visit the person. And this is where you may have heard stories of children being interrogated by prevent officers who are essentially counterterrorism officers. Okay, so it's not even just PC plod. This is a counterterrorism officer. Anybody who had a police officer knocking at their door would feel slightly intimidated. To know that they're coming from the counterterrorism unit is even more intimidating. As an adult, let alone if you're a child, um, we've had uh, examples of children who have been at school and who have been questioned in school by themselves. The teacher has led them to a room and they've been questioned by a counterterrorism officer for half an hour. And in one case, actually eight-year-old for almost an hour, his entire lunchtime, he was being questioned by not one, but two counterterrorism officers and a social worker. And there's never been any evidence to suggest that prevent is stopping acts of terrorism. And when you see in the media these um, comments about, you know, we've foiled X number of plots, that is a plot. Therefore, somebody was plotting, somebody was preparing. That's got nothing to do with prevent, right? Because prevent comes before that. So what they're really describing is pursue. But then you see later a few sentences down in the, in the article, maybe even as the headline, they're talking about prevent. And so the layperson thinks, and rightly so, that prevent is there to prevent terror attacks. And who wouldn't want that, right? Everybody wants to prevent a terror attack. Nobody wants to be the parent or the sister or the loved one of somebody who dies at a terror attack. That's, that's horrific. Like nobody wants to be in that position. So everybody is gonna say, yes, we don't wanna be impacted by terrorism, we want to prevent it. And by conflating these terms, um, it really causes a lot of harm because people actually think what they're supporting is a legitimate policy to stop terror acts, when in fact there's been no evidence to suggest it does. And the government today has been unwilling to interrogate prevent. They, they, even in this report, they haven't actually interrogated prevent, and that's what everyone wants, interrogate prevent and see if this is actually doing what it says on the tin, and if it is, Bring the evidence forward, show us. The primary criticism of this program has come from Muslims who feel that they have been disproportionately targeted by it. And, you know, in 2016, 65% of all the referrals to the Prevent program were referrals of Muslims. And of those, 2,000 were Muslim children, primarily at school. What are the stories that you have been hearing uh, from these people, from from the people that have been referred to, uh, and particularly these children that that uh, that are uh, finding themselves in the spotlight as a result? So my role is as caseworker at Prevent Watch. So I have listened to over 200 of these individuals who have called the helpline, and we've dealt with over 600 individuals who have called, and. They are mainly children, uh, not children calling, but the families are mainly calling on behalf of their children who have been referred from primary school, to secondary school, some in sixth form, like college. And we've had a case, for example, of a four-year-old who you may be familiar with this case, but he was talking about the game Fortnite. And this was automatically referred as a prevent referral. The teacher didn't even speak to the parent. Um, actually, when we got some information uh, from that school, we realized in the notes that they had already made reference to this child talking about online video games because he was with his like older cousins and so he was familiar with them. So it's not like this was just like this new child who appeared out of nowhere and he made this reference. Like They knew the child. They knew he had older cousins that he had been around them while they were playing uh, online games. Now he was referred to prevent and the parents received a knock on the door at half past 10 in the night from police who were coming to check the home to see if there were guns and bombs in the shed. Like this was a default. Obviously, there was a huge breakdown in trust then between the mother and the school, even though, of course, the police officer realized, OK, this is a nonsense referral. And even though this will be noted down as a referral that didn't get passed onto the de-radicalization program, OK, it's one of the false misinformed referrals there is still harm and impact that's been done because firstly, this family who live on a very quiet street have had police show up at their door 
So just the embarrassment in terms of like my neighbors are watching, what do they think? That stigma is one part. The other part is now having to deal and re mend that relationship again with the school who you feel have massively betrayed you because they've just referred your child and you know they're not saying oh I think your child's being naughty like they're saying your child could potentially be a terrorist in the future that's what you're getting from this, this message a four -year -old right child. yeah a four-year-old child so this is like one example of story other stories are you know you can see more tangible harm so we had a a, a young boy who um, was starting sixth form he thought he was actually going in for like an induction day. He went to go and meet the new members of staff and he ended up being questioned on a prevent referral that was made several years prior to that. So the school had shared the information with the next school, the college, so he couldn't even start fresh from that experience. And again, that prevent referral came to nothing. So technically you would look at it and say, well, it's come to nothing, you know, rather safe than sorry, but it's having tangible harms. He ended up having his place withdrawn from that sixth form in September as he was about to start. So can you imagine being in a position where you think you're gonna start sixth form in September and now you've had your place withdrawn and you have to go and find another college? How do you explain to that college why you are looking for a college in September, October? Like how bad does that look? Um, and how do you get over that of, of what's just happened to you? So I think a lot of these cases that come through, yes, they're from the Muslim community. We also get calls from people who aren't Muslim, who have had you know, what would be considered far right referrals and they're equally nonsense. You know, we've had children being referred for, you know, talking about history and things and, and the teacher saying, well, you know a bit too much about these world wars and you know a bit. So essentially they're being criminalized for what their intellect, for the fact that they're reading above their age. And we've seen this in the notes of, of the prevent referral. It's like, oh, they're, they're reading uh, inappropriate material for their age. And they don't mean inappropriate as in it's harmful. They just feel that they're at such a higher level intellectually that all of a sudden what that's intimidating that a child should actually go on to read more should actually have a keen interest in history so these are some of the referrals that we get even when they're non-muslim so you deal with a lot of individual cases individual experiences but when you zoom out and you look at the communal impact of a program like this on say the muslim community what does that picture look like so people often look at the numbers which is really harmful because Yes, the numbers tell you a part of the story, but they don't tell you everything. So you can look at it and say, okay, over the last six or seven years, over about 4,000 people have been referred to prevent, according to the statistics, which by the way, we think is very conservative because we know there have been cases that haven't been logged officially, but they were prevent referrals. So you look at it and you say, okay, 42,000, 45,000 have been referred to prevent since 2015. That only counts the people who have been referred to prevent. It doesn't count their families. It doesn't count their communities. It doesn't count particularly the Muslim communities who know prevent exists, even if some of them don't even know it by name. They know this like list or some kind of consequence to their children being too Muslim exists. And it causes them to self-censor. It causes a huge amount of paranoia so I had one client, for example, who didn't want to um, share information with her doctor because she had previously been involved with Prevent for her younger child. Um, and so then when she was in a completely different situation, actually in intensive care with her young baby, she was questioning why the doctor wanted to do like certain tests. She was like, why do they want to do that? Are they going to share the data? Which sounds overly paranoid, but actually they had done it to her previously. And so you can imagine every person that she may have told or every person who may have heard of her story or every person who doesn't know of her story, who just knows that Prevent exists and that is taking this stance particularly towards Muslim, is quite traumatized by it and very disempowered. So I think it's definitely shutting down the confidence of Muslims, particularly to participate in political life. Um, I think a lot of organizations and individuals feel that if there isn't a predominant mainstream NGO speaking about this topic, then they shouldn't. And they shy away from saying some of the more um, frank things about prevent. So you'll see a lot of Muslim organizations are diluting down their messaging. And, you know, they rely on mainstream NGOs who are non-Muslim to say, OK, you can say that. We can't say that because we're Muslim. Why? Why is your credibility as a Muslim if you're showing evidence and you're putting evidence forward as to how this harms you and your community? Why is that any less credible? The prevent strategy that has been put forward and has been widely criticised is being criticised for the wrong reasons. It's being criticised as somehow an attempt to restrict freedom of expression and belief. Not at all. The right way to criticise prevent 
is that it has been ineptly and inefficiently distributed so that people in the civil service and elsewhere haven't had the guidebook, haven't had the tool, haven't had the Grey's anatomy, as it were, to know which organisations to support and which not to. In the Muslim community, this program uh, here in the UK is, is notorious. They, uh, as you mentioned, I don't think there is a single Muslim that isn't aware of the Prevent program or at least aware of the fact that there is some kind of program that they, on some level, are susceptible to. But outside of this Muslim community, is the same level of awareness there? Are people in the public here in the UK ha are aware not only of the program itself, but of its potential shortcomings? I don't think it does, only based on some of the conversations that I've had. So when I'm speaking to um, you know, other Muslim parents and you know, we're talking a bit about Prevent and, or what I do, and maybe then the topic comes up, um, you know, they seem familiar with it. Um, when I'm speaking to some of my non-Muslim friends and other parents and you speak about Prevent, they tend not to really know what it is, particularly if they're in a community where there's not a huge amount of diversity. Even some of the teachers, when you speak to them and they're in um, areas that have a high number of Muslims, they're a bit more conscious of this idea that, you know, radicalization, we need to look out for radicalization because of safeguarding. Then you speak to other teachers who are in predominantly non-Muslim schools uh, and you talk about safeguarding and this idea of radicalization doesn't quite come up. Having said that though, it is definitely creeping into those spaces as well, almost as a justification um, to, to kind of justify that, oh, it's not discriminatory. Um, but we don't believe that's true and we don't believe it should be targeting any community. This lack of visibility, this lack of awareness, in the wider UK society about this prevent program, but also the criticisms against it. Has that made it difficult for people like yourself, critics of this program to speak out publicly? Yeah, I think there are layers of opaqueness. So there are certain things that you cannot gain access to with regards to prevent. Um, everything ha was very, very secretive initially. Even the statistics, for example, they started publishing that in 2015, 2016, even though, you know, Prevent was, although it was made statutory at that time, it was actually operating a good few years before that. Um, so even when they try to act as if they're being transparent, there's still layers of opaqueness in there. It's quite deceptive. So, for example, um, the transparency around age. You know, if you look at the age range that they're describing, um, five to 15 year olds, for example, being referred to prevent and then 16 to 21 or 16 to 25, I can't remember the other range, but I do know that it captures what are legally children, right? So the 16, the 17 year olds, they are still children. So the true picture of how many children are, are referred by prevent or referred to prevent, should I say, you don't know that. Nobody can actually tell you the real figure for that because the way in which they produce the statistics and demonstrate them doesn't reveal exactly what the impact is. So it's very difficult from one sense in terms of to get a true picture of who's targeted, when, how. You know, a lot of the concerns are never ever mentioned um, unless we mention them through our stories and people expose that. And they say, okay, this is what happened. This is the example of a prevent referral. This is what really happened. Otherwise, you, you will never see that in a government document. Um, when we've put in freedom of information requests, People have been very, uh, you know, councils, for example, when we were doing the People's Review of Prevent, which was an alternative to this government review, um, we put in FOIs to every single local authority, almost 300 local authorities um, uh, across the UK. And we were asking very basic questions, which people should know, like, are you a Prevent priority area, i.e. do you get extra funding to do Prevent? Because there are some areas that have extra funding to do Prevent. And if so, can you tell us you know, how much you get extra to do prevent? And what was the criteria that you had to meet in order to get this extra funding? And a lot of the responses were all the same, or same sentences. And they said, we do not hold this information. How can you not know if you're a prevent priority area? Mm. If you're a local authority, you would know you're a prevent priority area because you would have been told that. You would have been given extra money for it. Right. So and then so, some. So surely they know whether they're getting extra money. <laughs> exactly, or not. and some even worse said, "Yes, we are a prevent priority area." And then on the question of how much funding, we don't hold that information. How can you not know how much more money you got to do it? So it's there are layers of opaqueness to try and understand how prevent works. Okay, who's getting money? Why? Um, all of these things are very difficult. And then there's an additional layer that we see often as Prevent Watch. 
sometimes we have clients who want to come forward with their story and they want to share their story and they're up for doing you know mainstream media and so we take their story to a journalist and we say look we have this person they want to they want to talk um, you know can you facilitate that you put it in your journal whatever it is and then there's silence and you would think that some of these stories would you know people would want to hear about them um, but they seem not, it's not so much from the journalists, it te- seems to be from the editorial position that they go to the editor and they say, look, there's this about Prevent, are you interested? And they're not. They're not interested in, in showing this. And I think one of the examples, really good example, is the Trojan Horse Affair. Yeah, the, that podcast series, um, you know, it had to be done in the States. It wasn't even covered here until everyone realized how good the podcast was and were raising questions. And then there was some very like lukewarm coverage about it uh, in the UK. Why did it take for it to be made in the States and to be published there and then to go viral there before anybody started to kind of respond here in the UK? And even then when they responded, actually when government responded, they responded with a a report by a a right wing think tank. I won't even justify the name for, but um, they they put out a report, and Michael Gove said in he I think he gave the forward to that report, and he said, "This is the final word on what should be said on Trojan Horse. Like this is it. That's it. I don't want to hear any more arguing about it. It's almost like a parent. Like that's it. I don't want to hear it. Uh, I don't want to hear anyone talking about anything else. My word is final. Here you go. This is the report, which is ridiculous because it's completely shutting down." any concerns, any criticisms, and anyone else's voice, even though Michael Gove was deeply entrenched in that Trojan horse affair. And the reason the Trojan horse affair is so important is because it happened just before the introduction of prevent on the statutory duty, because they were saying, by the way, guys, you know, our children at school are being um, are being subjected to these views that are really problematic. You know, they're trying to Islamicize kids in Birmingham schools. Uh, this is a safeguarding issue. And then they brought in prevent Uh, and and stuck it onto safeguarding at around about that same time, just after that. Uh, It's interesting that you bring up the the Trojan horse affair, the podcast, but also the incident itself, uh, which relates to this this, uh, letter that was leaked to the media that appeared on surface level, uh, at least, to suggest some kind of conspiracy happening in in, uh, UK schools and that tried to radicalize or, or Islamicize these schools that then was proven... Uh, or at least highly suggested by both the podcast but others uh, who have seen it as well that the letter itself was fabricated or or fake. And yet it had had a uh, tremendous impact on the counterterrorism policies, on the way the media has treated counterterrorism, but also the way that the media and the government, uh, under Michael Gove specifically, treated the Muslim community. And it's interesting uh, because this report that you mentioned that that came out and government back report uh, responding to the New York Times podcast that was looking at this uh, event. Um, in that report, there is a large list of people that were highlighted as criticizing uh, the program itself, uh, criticizing the government's counterterrorism response and speaking about the Trojan horse. In some instances, people that had tweeted about the podcast were mentioned by name. Their tweets were printed in that report. And it, there is a parallel that I see with uh, this prevent review because there was a fear uh, by yourself and others that this would be the similar case in this re- report, in this review. Um, where does that fear come from? And does it really suggest a kind of uh, relationship or a lack of relationship between the Muslim community and this program, but the government itself? I think that fear, it's its not really a, a fear as such as it is a fact of every time um, a story has been put forward, whether it's the uh, client's own testimonial, whether it's stats and evidence that are put forward by ourselves or other NGOs, um, it's always rubbished and it's always seen as a myth and it's always, um, you know, we're, we're told we're fear-mongering. This isn't true. Uh, and somebody else comes out and says, no, no, this never happened. I mean, so many of the cases, like the uh, Kuka bomb case where a child, a uh, four-year-old child said um, he drew a picture of a cucumber, of his dad cutting a cucumber, and he pronounced it Kuka bomb. Or at least that's what the uh, nursery teacher heard, and she referred that. That was one of the very early cases that was published uh, around Prevent. 
And it was very embarrassing, you know, for counterterrorism officers to see, oh my God, it really is this what <laughs> is this what Prevent is doing? It's it's referring four year olds for mispronouncing cucumber. Um and when that happened, you know, it was seen as no, this is this is not true. This case just isn't true. And there are various other cases that have been, you know, we've been told this isn't true. Even cases where we have worked on the documents, also, like we have seen the initial prevent referrals and we're being told by people who are pushing prevent a completely different story. And we're like, we saw that we know this case intimately. And other NGOs are in a similar position where if you raise concerns around prevent, it is part of the problem. And actually, I think that's one of the recommendations that I thought, saw very quickly on my way here was... Um, you know, to to make sure that there is a specific response. I think there's like some home security response. There needs to be a specific group, I think is what uh, Shawcross is advocating, to shut down and, and deal specifically with these people raising these concerns, which is hugely problematic, um, not only because we're already being smeared um, and, and labeled as like extremists or enablers of terrorism. In fact, the previous PM, uh, David Cameron, wrote a forward to another report by the same think tank, government-backed think tank. Um, and he said that people raising concerns essentially were enabling terrorism. So that really makes NGOs think twice because they're thinking, well, hold on, if I raise concerns about this, about Prevent specifically, then I'm going to be labeled, what, an enabler of terrorism? And that is a serious charge. Like, terrorism is a serious offense. So for you to be enabling terrorism, I mean, that's like the worst label somebody could give you. Um, other than a terrorist itself, but you're an enabler, so I don't know how that is any better. But um, so, so that is where the fear comes from, and I think that is why Prevent Watch were conscious um, specifically that we may be mentioned because in the other review, the People's Review of Prevent, um, because we had put all the evidence forward, because all the NGOs had supported it, uh, because it had um, forwards from the UN Special Rapporteur on protecting freedoms while countering terrorism, as well as Conagirti, Professor Conagirti, um, who is Electra and, and KC now uh, in human rights. It was a very strong report. And so they couldn't attack the arguments. In fact, they have never attacked the arguments and the evidence that we've put forward. What they do is they just go for the organization. And it's an age old tactic, you know, smear the messenger, don't engage with the message because you can't engage with the message because you know that the message is right. You know that the evidence is there and it backs up everything that we've put forward. So that's where the fear came from. William Shawcross has led a superb independent review of PREVENT, for which I am very grateful. PREVENT has shown cultural timidity and an institutional hesitancy to tackle Islamism for fear of the charge of Islamophobia. These are false charges that spread fear and misinformation within communities. So we're taking a look at these findings uh, together. It's still a very fresh look, but already we can see um, some of the, the things that you've highlighted here in the recommendations. There are two recommendations, at least, that specifically take a look at the critiques of PREVENT and the people that are criticizing PREVENT. So one uh, calls for the establishment of a dedicated unit in Homeland Security Group uh, that is in charge of, of uh, rebuting misinformation about PREVENT and challenging inaccuracies on social media. Another one one uh, calls for civil society organizations that receive prevent funding to be tasked with challenging and exposing groups that promote this information, again, on social media, even in the conclusion itself. Uh, it says very clearly that uh, that the government has to do more, has to go to greater lengths to uh, instill this public sense of pride, but also take on disinformation and, demonize, and demonization campaigns that are led by bad faith actors. Do you consider yourself a bad faith actor? I mean, I might be the wrong faith for putting any evidence forward because as a Muslim, um, inherently my uh, somehow my objectivity and my credibility is automatically questioned because I'm raising things that are discriminatory towards Muslims. Uh, and I did have this question asked to me previously, you know, oh, well, why are you doing this? And, and is there a conflict of interest? And yeah, there's a conflict of interest because I'm a visibly Muslim woman. So if that's what you're referring to, then yes. If you're referring to the fact that I work at Prevent Watch and I have listened to directly over 200 people who have been impacted by Prevent and seen the evidence as to what is happening to them and the harms, then of course, like there is a conflict of interest because I've actually seen the evidence. And I have at my fingertips over 600 uh, clients who have been impacted by Prevent. I have that resource on the database. I can see all that information and I can see the, the different types of harms that have happened. But essentially, 
um, what this, these recommendations show is that the government is unwilling to take any criticisms or concerns. I mean, part of the remit, part of the remit of this report was to um, put recommendations forward for how to deal with concerns and criticisms around prevent. And this is the answer. You know, we've been waiting four years for a report and the answer is shut it down. Part of the issue that I see here, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that there was very little, uh, if any, Muslim organizations that took part in this review that were that were um, involved in recommendations or involved in, in um, uh, the process of, of pulling together this report. I mean, 450 Muslim organizations, of which 350 mosques and imams, boycotted this review almost right from the beginning. Why was that? Nobody felt that this was even an attempt to put forward a truly independent reviewer. So after they appointed Lord Carlisle initially, so Lord Carlisle was initially appointed, he was seen as biased because he had previously been involved in some of the recommendations when Prevent was like partially reviewed in 2011. And not only that, but the way they appointed him did not follow the protocol that they should have followed. So there was a legal challenge. He stepped down. He didn't He didn't go through the legal challenge. He stepped down. And this opened the door for somebody else to be appointed. And you would think that after the legal challenge and after all of the concerns raised once he was appointed, that the government would have a look and think, OK, this is an important, you know, we're saying this is an important part of our counterterrorism strategy. And we want it to be independently reviewed. And we want people to feel that there is an independent reviewer. And instead, they did the exact opposite it was a slap in the face to anybody who had raised criticisms by putting William Shawcross there he has made publicly you know well-known statements about how Islam is a problem um, he he has constantly supported every single war and terror policy for the last 20 years so there is no reason to suggest that he would do anything other than resupport prevent and if you look at one of the recent FOIs put in by Rights and Security International, they uh, revealed that the Home Office has been interfering with this report since April. So there's been huge interference, and he's essentially written exactly what they wanted to hear. Or perhaps they've written it during the editing process, we don't know. But they've definitely been meeting, uh, William Shawcross has definitely been meeting with the Home Office repeatedly since April, um, and there has been you know, maybe some rewriting of the report. I'm not sure what has happened with the report. Maybe it was such a shambles in the first place that they had to try and get it back to a point where it was actually justified to put in front of Parliament. So you have concerns about just how independent this process has been? Oh, absolutely. The independent reviewer is not independent. That's why everyone boycotted. I mean, we're talking about Muslim, organi- like 450 organizations, then there were an additional 100 uh, experts and, and people well-known, you know, well-known individuals in the community who had concerns and they were mainly Muslim. You don't get 500 Muslims to agree, even when aid is, let alone to agree that Shawcross is not the right person to be doing this review, right? So you had that agreement, plus you had the mainstream NGOs, the Liberties, the Amnesties, the Ronnie Meads, who were also boycotting this, saying, we're not gonna engage, we're not gonna give it credibility. And we didn't. And then instead of giving that credibility on our own terms, Right? So that people didn't say, well, you know, nobody could hear your evidence because you boycotted. On our own terms, we put forward the People's Review of Prevent, which captured all the reports and all of the testimonies from those clients, and we put it into one report. And that has been sent to everyone. So nobody can say, well, we didn't see it. Right? That, that's been out there for a year. Okay? That's been out there since February of 2022. And I think it's important because essentially nobody wanted to engage with Shawcross. So who did he engage with? What is his evidence for these recommendations? I mean, I haven't gone through the report fully, but I, that is exactly what I'll be looking for. What is the evidence? And what do the actions mean now that you're going to take forward? Because I can see that just from the brief thing of the actions around concerns and criticisms, it's very clear what he wants the actions to be. Just make them shut up. We don't want to hear it. We don't want to engage with it. And we don't genuinely want to improve it. So he does seem to highlight a few things that do need to be changed or altered about the program. But by and large, the tone of it is, and I can read from his conclusion here, it is impossible not to be impressed by those who work on this program, some of whom face intolerable abuse and intimidation for their efforts. And the other uh, strong theme of this report, and this was highlighted in the leaks that we saw a few months ago, was that 
Shawcross believes that there hasn't been enough of a focus on Islamist extremism and that Prevent needs to prioritize that. What does that mean to you? I mean, I think his sympathies are misaligned. <laughs> he is sympathetic towards people who are receiving Prevent funding to do a job and go and do that job, but has no sympathy to the thousands of children who are being interrogated. And these are innocent children, right? Even by Prevent's own flawed logic. We know the logic of Prevent is flawed. Okay, let's accept that flawed logic for, for a second. Even by Prevent's logic, these are innocent children who are being traumatized. But his sympathies lie with the people who are carrying out Prevent. We know that organizations and individuals have been shut down. People have shut their accounts down. Academics who thought that they had a certain immunization because they're academics and because, you know, freedom of speech and within universities have shut down their social media accounts because the minute they have spoken out about Prevent, they have been trolled and they have been abused online, right? And these people do not have the support of the government. People who are receiving Prevent funding do have the support of the government and yet somehow the sympathies should be for them and they are the people who are insulted like the entire muslim community is being targeted by that by this and there is a justification of that islamophobia right in this report as well as all the leaks that have come out so far there is actually a justification to say well actually the reason why we're targeting muslims is because muslims are the biggest threat right but there's no sympathy there and instead we're supposed to so that's the first thing i want to mention the second thing is that this whole idea that there's not a big enough um, a big enough focus on Islamist extremism. Firstly, there isn't there isn't an extremism. Okay, we need to be talking about terror acts. Uh, we need to be talking about what the experts are saying. And the experts are saying actually, if we want to start talking about different groups, far right is posing a huge threat. But are we surprised that somebody who said that Islam is one of the greatest problems that Europe has to face has said? Oh, we need to refocus on, on, on Islam? No, we don't. We're not surprised by that. Also, we don't believe that prevent should be focused on anyone because it is not working. We need to stop thinking about, okay, which community is going to come out of this worse off because nobody's winning. Like, nobody is winning by having prevent in place. And the real question should have been, is prevent working? Not who should it be focused on? Who should something that, like, something isn't working, who should we focus it on? No. Okay, go back to prevent and interrogate prevent and ask whether it's working or not. And I don't believe for a second that he can at any, any point in this report point to evidence that prevent has saved lives because you can't. But we can show, what we can show, what we do have the evidence for is that prevent has been there even when lives were lost. So many of the people who have committed terror, terror acts have been known to prevent. Right? And they were also known beyond Prevent, because Prevent is like somewhere over here on the spectrum in that pre-crime space. And then, you know, they were known by MI5. They were known by people who had more power, more authority to actually engage them and stop them. And they weren't stopped. So I think some honesty needs to be uh, in this report, which clearly isn't. Um, but yeah, we're not surprised by any of that. And we think that the whole idea of it being not focused enough on Islamists is, is a joke, because when you look at the evidence, actually, enough money is being pumped into these priority areas, and these priority areas have higher numbers of Muslims. And that is why, that is the criteria for which they are chosen as prevent priority areas. Uh, what do you make of the government response, uh, which we've already seen? The Home Secretary, Suella Breverman, has come out saying that she wholeheartedly accepts all 34 recommendations and that Prevent will now ensure focuses on the key threat of Islamist terrorism. What do you make of that? I mean, we knew that she was going to um, endorse all the recommendations because this had been mentioned previously. We knew that this was one of the recommendations because um, one particular um, newspaper outlet seemed to have the unredacted report a couple of months ago, strangely enough, even though it hadn't been laid in front of Parliament. So questions need to be asked about how, you know, this isn't just a leak a, a few days before the, the thing is being published. We've waited about two months. Um, and, and it yet, looks remarkably similar, right? It's very similar. It's mm. verbatim. On some, they didn't even try to change uh, the language. Um, but we're not surprised by this kind of hardline approach. I think the government that is sitting in the UK today is extremely authoritarian. Um, know that they can get away with being quite openly Islamophobic. Um, and the problem is, is that when they do so, they don't even back it up with evidence and they chop and change in terms of 
uh, which numbers they want to use to justify things. So when you want them to talk about terrorism, actual terrorism, because this is what is supposed to stop terrorism, they don't speak about terrorism, they speak about extremism and all these terms to try and confuse you. And then when they're speaking about certain acts, they try to trigger the emotional response and speak about a specific terror act, for example, uh, that involved a Muslim. Finally, Dr. Leila, this seems like a very clear breakdown in trust between the Muslim community and not only the PREVENT program, but the UK government itself. Where to from here? How can this relationship be healed? I mean, I think the first thing is to understand the real implications of what this report means, because we've seen all the bait and we've seen the leaks, but what does it mean in its operation? You know, what does this mean? We knew they were never going to scrap it, right? They weren't going to come out and say we scrap prevent. In fact, they didn't even put that down as part of the terms of reference. It was never in the terms of reference for it to be even considered. Um, so we knew that. I think this is not just a breakdown in trust between the Muslim community and government. I think this is a breakdown in trust in every part of civil society and government. I think it's a breakdown in trust in terms of how this country is treating children because those are the people predominantly impacted by PREVENT. These are innocent children being harmed in every element of life from their mental health to the actual like education and, and work prospects. Um, so I think the way forward from this is essentially that people realize it might be a very good thing because maybe people will realize across the board there's been a lot of division. It, there's been a lot of, oh, it's Islamist, oh, it's far right. So the far right are looking at it going, oh, it's the Muslims that are a problem. You know, the Muslims are saying, oh, it's good that there's more far right, right? It's not just us. That's the wrong way to be looking at this. This does not work, it is harmful. And we cannot leave that door open for a refocus to go back to the Muslim community and for other communities to feel and for other civil society actors to feel that this is not their problem. It is. Because once it is cemented again via the Muslim community, it will get extended again for whoever is going to be labelled extremist of the day. So I think the only way forward now, and maybe it is much more obvious, is that everyone comes together to push back on all of these recommendations and demand for a truly independent review of Prevent. Dr. Laila Eitarhaj, thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Cheers.